room episode 43 um as i usually say this is this is an important special episode for us we have raheem bell and ron blaylock uh two of the most successful businessmen um that have ever come through the program and i'm just uh, really looking forward to them sharing their journey um uh, most importantly post georgetown uh so with that without further ado I'd like to introduce Ron Blaylock and Raheem Bell. And um, we'll just, uh, yeah, guys, I I'll start from the top. Uh, let's talk about your journey to the hilltop, what that represented to you, uh, what that meant to you. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just kick it, we'll kick it off from there. Go ahead, Raheem. Okay. Hello, it's, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor. Um, in terms of coming to Georgetown, I, I really actually have to attribute a lot of uh, that to my co-guest, Ron, um, because when I was a senior in high school in New York City, you know, grew up in Harlem, both my parents went to Columbia University and uh, I was gonna go to Columbia until I went to a, an event that Ron hosted at Payne Weber uh, for uh, you know, minority prospective students. And he just, you know, he really caught my attention. And, um, you know, I, after the uh, presentation, I, I went up to him, I got his number, and then he actually invited me to, he, he was a very successful bond trader at the time at Payne Weber. So he actually invited me down to, to the trading floor. And I went and he pretty much taught me kind of how the bond market worked. and. You know, but then also taught me more, told me more about Georgetown, what it was like. And I said, wow, I said, uh, you know, and, and Ron's a few years ahead of me. I said, look, if Ron, can, if he can do this with a Georgetown degree, I want to I want to do this. And uh, I, you know, I then went to the Minorities Perspective Weekend at Georgetown and I knew I made the right decision. It was a it was a, a life altering decision because I literally was going to stay home in Harlem and 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 and. Uh, just walk right to Columbia University. But man, am I glad that I met Ron and, and went to that presentation because that, that really changed everything for me. And uh, it, was, it, it was, like I say, a life-changing decision that uh, I look back on and say, thank God for that. And, and that's what, um, what, what, what you just said, we could actually end the show um, because that's what Hoya Locker Room is all about, that fellowship, that brotherhood, what you just talked about, Ron didn't even know you at the time. Am I, am I correct? 
Correct. And, and the fact that he reached out, um, it made a difference. And I just, just want to celebrate that. I mean, I, I had the, the fortune of playing with Ron for two years. And um, I can't speak fondly enough about this guy, um, what he represented, um, what, what he displayed. It wasn't about what he told you. Um, it, was, it, was, it was about what, you know, what he did, his actions. And you, you just kind of, uh, and I don't want to jump ahead. I'm going to let you jump in, Ron, because, you know, I, I, I'll be talking about you all day. Um, so, yeah, give, give, give us the, uh, the, the, the snapshot of your journey to the hilltop. And you can leave out the cat from Hunter Huss. You know, you don't need to bring him up. <laughs> well, 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 first, Gene and Markham, uh, again, thanks for having me. Uh, as Raheem said, I'm honored and, and thrilled to be a part of it. And Raheem, your, your words and what you just said about that Payne Weber event, I, I can't thank you enough for, for, for sharing that and, 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 and remembering that. Uh, and I'm just, to, to have any impact on, uh, on your journey, that, that's, that's, that's a gift to me, <laughs> really, Raheem. So uh, thank you, thank you for, for saying that. Uh, my, my journey to the Hilltop was, uh, you know, I hadn't heard of Georgetown until they recruited me. Uh, wasn't really familiar with them, uh, with the university. And, and I was just blessed that uh, Big John found me through his network of people uh, and showed up at my house in Winston-Salem, uh, North Carolina. Um, and that was a blessing uh, to me that, that he found me because uh, I, I had no awareness of Georgetown at all. And so just again, fortunate, blessed, lucky that um, he showed up and um, uh, had, had attention and focus on me at that time uh, and recruited me. And it was just a, a wonderful occurrence. <laughs> well said, well said. Raheem and, and Ron, this is for both of you. Um, you both experienced success on the hilltop, um, on the court. Um, Big East championships, Big East regular season championships, elite eights, uh, final fours, national championships. Um, what role did that play for you post Georgetown in terms of how you approached um, business, how you approached uh, your careers professionally? I'll defer to you, Ron, on that. Yeah, I, I'd say that, you know, all those experiences, Gene, you know, and being at that kind of high level of performance, high level of expectations, you know, it was, you know, I may, I may just say that the, the, the expectation curve was high. Uh, I mean, Big John, you know, we, we weren't there to just, you know, win 20 games. We weren't there just to get to the semifinals of the Big East tournament. Um, we weren't there just to get to the sweet 16. So, it was that expectation curve that really has helped me so much in how I approach my career, business, uh, goal setting. Uh, like right now, for example, at our private equity fund, we got this, you know, big goal setting, Raheem, of, you know, getting three and a half times our money in three and a half years. Well, that's, that's hard to do. But guess what? That that's the expectation. So go figure it out. Uh, so it, it was a lot of that, Gene and, and Raheem. You speak to this, uh, but it, it was that expectation curve and that it, 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 that's helped me pursue things and be creative, ambitious, determined, whatever. But it's not to just show up. Yeah, no, I would I would echo that, and uh, you know, because. Uh, you know, Big John, it was championship or bust, right? Every year. And so we we knew every year walking in, that was what was expected. Um, and, you know, I, I would say the other thing that I, I took away from it was just being able to handle pressure. Um, you know, a, a lot of my career was on Wall Street and uh, in particular on the trading floor, where if you, you know, you messed up something during a live trade, you know, it could mean 
um, you know, a, a lot of money to the firm and, 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 and it could mean your career, frankly. And so there are a lot of situations where there was just pressure on you to perform um, and not make a mistake. And the fact that, you know, we went through those, those four years of having to perform under pressure. Now I didn't have to perform under the kind of pressure that Ron and, and the players, just full disclosure, I was, oh, I was a manager. Yes, you did, no, <laughs> dog. Yes, you did. I'm not, you wouldn't be on this program if you didn't have to perform under the same type of pressures. We're not going to let you off the hook. Right, because, okay. I appreciate neither, one, that. neither one of you address whether or not the verbal, the verbal that we experienced how was uh, that mirrored in your professional world? I'm sure it was easier in your professional world. Oh, it, it, yeah, it was all downhill from there. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so yeah, I, I didn't take any last minute shots, but certainly there was pressure to perform as managers. Markham and I were, were always under the gun. Markham was, was usually the first guy under the gun and I was, you know, as well. But, you know, I mean, we were constantly asked to do things and perform and execute as well. And so that level of ex excellence and performance was expected of everyone across the organization, you know, from players to managers to Laurie Michael, the trainer, and et cetera. So, you know, and, and again, you know, the good news is that my bosses have never quite yelled at me and, and called me, you know, the, the kind of the names MF. that- We just said the MF word, they, which was like- The MF word, name. right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I didn't get that kind of- uh, you know, language. So, so what they said was, was, was easy. It was like, oh, you're just going to, you know, so, so it made life a lot easier because when you can perform under that kind of pressure with that, that kind of, uh, you know, th th that, that kind of language, you know, you, you can on your perform neck. <laughs> on your neck, right, <laughs> exactly. Well, I want to put this into perspective for um, our listeners. Um, so Raheem, you were there 88, through 87 to 91. 87 through 91. You were student athlete, you, you, you were student athlete, scholarship athlete in 89, correct? Ron Blaylock was student athlete three years in a row. Um, I think it was eight, correct me if I'm wrong, 80, 81 and 82. So I wanted to put that in perspective in terms of why you were there. So you clearly were there to help that GPA. And I appreciate both of you for that. And then we, we, we turn into your professional careers. Rob, I'm going to start with you. Um, and this comes from one of your teammates. In 2008, Ron was in the derivative world for USB, saw the crash coming, bounced at the right time. He might be by far the smartest individual that I know. So if you could speak to that, and then I'll have uh, some words for Ron on the other, on the, on the other side. I'll yeah, no, that was uh, that was an interesting time to be uh, to be in finance and just for everyone. Um, you know, uh, I had you know right after graduation, I went to work at J.P. Morgan um, and did that for eight years, and then went on to uh, work for UBS for an additional uh, you know uh, eight years as well. And you know, I got to a point where you know, and at the time I was actually living in California. Um, the stock market had run up. It was a great time to be on Wall Street. You know, I really, you know, they say it's better to be lucky than good. You know, I got, I went to Wall Street at a very good time. And, um, you know, I, I would, if, if I were to say I called that, that crash, that 07, 08 market, I would be lying. Um, I did not, <laughs> but I, what I did do is I said, I, I have had a great run and, you know, 16 years, um, you know, everyone on Wall Street always says, when I get to this level or this amount that I've saved, I'm going to leave. And then when you get there, you, you kind of double or triple it and you keep doing it. And I just got, frankly, to the point where I said, you know, there, I think there's something else for me. Um, uh, you know, my, my boss at the time was, frankly, uh, uh, a functioning alcoholic. I didn't really look up and see anyone that I aspired to, to be in terms of career trajectory. Trajectory, and I said, um, you know, this is a good time. And uh, they, at the time, I was in California. They asked me to move back to New York because um, they needed more senior people in New York. And if I didn't take that offer, I would be able to leave, get a package, 
and get all my deferred equity. And I hit the bid. And sure enough, the following year, the you market- see, You see Ron over there? You see Ron, you got a little movement out of Ron. <laughs> yeah. I said, you know, and I'm so, gone. Yeah. <laughs> Two words. I, I was fortunate <laughs> enough to liquidate. And, and, you know, and then I, you know, had a little time of reprieve and everyone's calling me up, Ra, how did you know the market was going to crash? And, and I, again, I would, if I were to say I knew it was coming, I'd be lying. Uh, I just kind of went with my gut and said, this is a time for me uh, to make a change and, and take a step back. And that offered me the opportunity to do that. And I just got a little bit lucky with the timing, to be honest. We'll, we'll, we'll take that kind of luck, you know, because uh, one, one of the famous uh, quotes from Big John that I've used throughout, you know, my post Georgetown career, we play to beat the cheat. You feel me? So we are, I'm always coming to the, to the game. I'm always ready for the unexpected. And if you want to call that luck, uh, I think that's preparation. And your gut is, is prepared experience. So bravo to you. Mr. Blaylock, um, there was an article in 2017, Black Enterprise, 45 greatest moments in black business. Number 39 was Ron Blaylock Seals' $150 million deal. Um, if you could walk us through that, um, I'd love to hear about it. Um, again, um, what you stand for represents and epitomizes everything that that deflated basketball was all about. If you could talk to that, I'd love it. No, I, I can't, Gene. And uh, Raheem, as Gene said, uh, it wasn't just luck. <laughs> I mean, you might not have called it, but you were you were you were in front of the curve. Let's just call it that. <laughs> so uh, this deal that Gene's talking about, it was a $150 million deal that uh, Blaylock and Partners did for Texaco. Um, and this was uh, uh, Texaco, uh, this is, you know, I, I forget the, what, what year it was, Gene, but this was the first corporate bond deal that a minority owned firm, woman owned, Hispanic, black, you know, had ever done and led a transaction. And Texaco um, had gotten in an issue with um, something, you know, I, I forget the particulars of it, Gene, because I'm old. Uh, and but... you've, done, you've done other, other big deals. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but but they, they, so they, they were trying to reach out to their minority suppliers and we were doing some, some, some smaller things for them. And I met with the treasurer of Texaco and the CFO, I said, well, heck hell guys you want to move the curve will not you just let us lead a deal like you would goldman sachs or jp morgan or morgan stanley just we got the capability and you know obviously we had to show them that uh they weren't going to take that risk of exposure just because i said it jane um but that was a milestone and what it did it, it triggered corporations using minority women-owned African American, Hispanic, veteran firms. To the day, that was the first. That was the, the lift off of that. So, it, it goes back to the expectation curve that I said, Big John, and being part of Hoya Locker Room, was that I raised their expectation and therefore raised our expectations to, you know, it's literally maybe five years later we did a six billion dollar deal for AT and T. It, it had grown to that kind of, but without that Texaco proof point of, of the 150 million Raheem, we couldn't have gotten that exponential liftoff. And then we, uh, one of the proudest moments, Gene, was uh, when Google went public. Uh, we were part of that deal. And when they went to do the, the secondary Raheem, we were on the deal and we in, ended up uh, I think being the sixth most, uh, uh, the, the sixth highest distribution of anybody in that secondary off of Google. And Google had given us a shot. They say, if you guys perform, you know, go get it. And we leaned in, man. So, but, but, but the, my point was that that was, that was that Texaco deal, Gene, but, but it wow. led to a lot of other great things. Wow. Um, I'm going to take it back to the, hardwood and then I'm, I'm going to compare it to maybe some 
things that happened on the hilltop off the court. And I'll start start with you, Ra. Um, you've been known uh, to make sure uh, that the team spirit was always correct, uh, whether that was board games or trivia games or whatever the case may be, we're both smiling. Um, I wanna know what prompted you to take on that role. Also, I'd like you to talk about the time you practice with the team. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll start with, uh, you know, the board games. Um, so full disclosure, it was actually, Blackjack was my thing. <laughs> and I, you know- That's your limitations, dog. We good, we good money. <laughs> We're okay, okay. <laughs> but uh, I, I, look, I'll admit it. I've talked to my therapist about it. I started up a little gambling ring in on the team, you know? And uh, we, we, would, we would have a little uh, Blackjack round with our meal money that would, would go on and, uh, it, you know, it, it was fun. It kind of created camaraderie. We had a good time. At times it got a little bit heated. So we had to, uh, you know, as you all know, eventually Big John finds about it, out about everything. So um, it, it, I was actually doing pretty well with this. Uh, Big John found what out. What was that good at, right? What was that good telling you it was coming? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, but uh, that, that we, we had fun. You know, we had a lot of fun with that. Um, uh, in terms of playing, so I, you know, I played the high school basketball, but was never recruited and was never on that, that level, but, uh, and also played intramural, uh, Markham and I used to play with the assistant coaches all the time. So my senior year, uh, we had Alonzo got hurt. Um, I like saying that cause it sounds like I replaced Alonzo, but, um, Alonzo got hurt. And then we had some transfers. I think, uh, you know, of some of the younger guys transferred like Mike Sable, Dave Edwards and so forth. So we were short for practice and coach knew that I played. So he told me one day, he said, son, go, you know, it's kind of every manager's dream, right? Go suit up. And I, I ran up there so fast. I got the <laughs> uniform on and it was interesting because, you know, for, for three years, basically, I knew all the plays, of course, all the managers know the plays because we got to, you know, for three years, I'd be sitting on the sideline and I don't want to say berating, but criticizing maybe, you know, certain players about, you know, not being able to execute this play or this and that. Um, what I realized that day was it's very different when you are actually out on the court and running. And it also the level of athleticism like that I, I just had never experienced before. You know, so my first two shots got literally punched off the court, right? And so I said, you know what? I think I'm gonna play defense and I'm gonna pass the ball. <laughs> you know, that, that was what I was gonna focus on, but it was an amazing experience. I that thought- was, That sounds like my, my, my four years, right? That was my four years. That was my four but, years there. Defense right. and pass the ball. That was my four if years, thank you. you. As well as you. <laughs> if only I could have done it as well as you. And it's funny, cause in my mind, I thought this is gonna be a great story cause I'm gonna, I'm going to be that, walk, that that manager turned walk on who becomes like a starter. It, it, it did not happen. Um, but I was out there. I was playing. It got me in great shape. I loved it. But I, I, I honestly, I just developed a whole new appreciation for, you know, what the guys were doing, because up to that point, I was really, a, you know, more of a spectator. But when you, you realize, you know, running those plays when you're dealing with that kind of athleticism, it's just a whole different ball game. And I just developed a whole new respect for the, uh, all of the guys on the team and appreciation. And, and, but it was, it was an amazing experience for me. So before I jump to Ron, Big John, you practice your senior year. So Big John chose you over Stansbury. Is that correct? So, well, because I keep hearing about Stansbury who thinks he's a six foot post player. So please explain Stan. that. Oh, he brought him in. I got him in. <laughs> Mark, Markham, Markham can play. Mark, we used to have some battle royales with Coach Eshrick and, uh, and Riley. And, you know, uh, so Markham can definitely play. I think, honestly, I think the reason I got chosen was probably because Markham was coaches. That was his right-hand man. 
you know, he was like the lead manager. He was the go-to guy. Anything manager that was- Manager year three times in a row. I got it, I got it. Yeah, so, so you know, he needed his punch, and he was his punching bag, you know, yeah. and but he was a guy he relied on, and so he couldn't afford to lose him and put him on the court. So, yeah. so I think he chose I, I, me. I, I, I'm not going to allow my post game to be disparaged. I just had to drop in. Uh, and, 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 and also, Rod's one of the smartest guys I know, but his decision making on the basketball court can be, uh, it doesn't live up to his brain sometimes. Once we were playing out here in LA, and we're playing, oh, there's a guy, I don't know, you're you going to remember this, Rod, a uh, guy named Ron Frierson who played overseas in Australia. Ron is about 6'6", and he was the best player at the gym. But this particular Saturday, he couldn't hit the ocean. And your boy, although I was known for my post game, I was five of five from the three, plus I had a bucket in the post. Ron, you're good at math. That's uh, 17 points. We ain't playing the number 24. We come down, and Ron has not made a shot all game. We come down, and, and we play with a clock. Last play of the game, Ron's leading the break. I'm on the left. Ron is on the right. I'm wide open. Ron's wide open. I haven't missed a shot, and this dude passed the ball to Ron, and we lost the game. I'm still mad today. Apparently, I, that's I, all I got to say. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. out. <laughs> wow. Well, you're, wow. you're not a finisher, Mark. Oh, what you, you, you say? He's not a finisher. <laughs> <laughs> not a finisher. <laughs> Those okay. jumpers are one thing. <laughs> so, so, so with that, that that's a perfect segue because I can I can talk about Spike because I I wrote, I ran with Spike for two years on the white team, and. He was my number one option because <laughs> unbeknownst to him, 17. Ron could get buckets. Ron was straight down hill, yo. And if he, if he squared up, that jumper was going in. So when I tell you Ron and I was cool in the game because he knew I wasn't trying to shoot and that's all he was trying to do. So Ron, Ron was an All-American in practice, though. Didn't nobody want, because Ron would go 100 miles an hour, right? He was relentless. And, you know, the white team, we didn't have to play by the same rules. You know what I'm talking about, Ron. We could foul. <laughs> we didn't have to run the play. <laughs> so we were relentless. And this guy right here, when I tell you, nonstop motion. So I always want, if I never told you, dog, you made me a better player, man. Oh, God. Thank you, G. No, uh, that's hilarious. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. No doubt. Um, actually, I just lost my train of thought. I got caught up in it, Rob. <laughs> I, <got caught. laughs> I, I, I was like, man, this dude here, because it was just like the white team always was, we were free flowing. And I, I, I just had me a score. Number 30 was my score. Um, but with that, I'd like to ask you both. Um, remember your most memorable moments on the court, your most memorable moments off the court. Well, uh, my most memorable moment on the court, uh, Gene, you facilitated because I it was a dunk. We were playing Villanova, and Gene got a steal, and I was I was heading. Heading down court, Gene. Just like practice. Just like practice. And I went up and dunked, and it was like, yeah. <laughs> I so that was, you know, just from a personal standpoint on the court. Um, and off the court, it was actually um, you know, is 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 being on the bus before the game off the court or on the court, Gene. It qualifies for off the court, though. Okay. It's good money. It was uh, the final game, the championship game. Um, 82. 82. And Big John had a stand in Biloxi, Mississippi, you know. Uh, and I was on the bus. 
riding to the national championship game in the Superdome. And it was sort of Raheem and Mark and Gene. It was, it was sort of surreal. I was like, man, here I am. Three and a half years ago, I was in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, not knowing what Georgetown was and not hadn't anticipated this kind of stage or I, I dreamt it and thought of it, but here I was. And it, and it just hit me how it had gone by and it had happened. And this was it. This was what, you know, what you grew up hoping for, that you had that chance to be at that high level of competition. And it just, it just hit me on that ride from Biloxi to New Orleans that day, Gene. That, that was probably the most memorable off court kind of yeah, experience, you know, I, I, I had during my four years. Just that, you know, that yeah. awareness of what, 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 what had happened. What, what's going that, on there? Um, you know. I'm, I'm gonna stay with you for a second round with that um, because I was your teammate that year. Um, if I remember correctly, I think you and Smitty took me out or I hung out with you guys after the game and I might've had my first alcoholic beverage. Um, but I, I'd like you to talk about, cause what you just laid out was powerful for me because you know, it, it, it's a snapshot of something that, that just went by as college does goes by so fast. But yeah. Just, just talk about the impact of the game itself. Um, you, you being one of the six seniors on that team I often refer to the 82 team as the best team I think Georgetown's ever put on the court just because of that senior leadership. We can go player for player, Ra, and we can, you know, you got the Twin Towers over there and, you know, uh, whatever the case may be. But I just think that senior leadership was incredible. So, Ron, if you could just talk about that game itself and uh, if you could compare it to something uh, on the business tip, that same transformation that you saw play out. I know that's a lot, but yeah, no, no, no. It, it, that, that game and that year was obviously remarkable, and the game is still, you know, anybody would tell you is one of the top five college games of all time. Um, and it was, it was a preparation and an intensity. Again, you know, Big John before the game and how we were focused, you know, in, in our practice before the games. It was just that intensity. Uh, and everybody showed up with, this is ours, you know, this is ours. This is, we're here and, and only getting the trophy is gonna matter. Uh, but it was that pregame, it was that awareness uh, to where Patrick came out and blocked, you know, the first whatever five shots and, you know, and, and Sleepy was doing his thing and Big Ed and you know Smitty was around. You know it just it, it all the elements just showed up, um, uh, and to, to take them on like North Carolina, we didn't care. <laughs> you know that we 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 gonna do us, and that's gonna work. <laughs> that that's how that game was, and it obviously you know came down to the wire. Um, but it, it's again showing up. If I look at <clears throat> at the business side of it uh, is like, um, no, when we were on that Google IPO, Gene, it was like, okay, we're going to go head to head and try to outperform, you know, uh, first boss and Raheem, JP Morgan or UBS. We're going to, we're going to outperform them. You know, uh, we, we, we showed up to play mm -hmm. uh, and the results worked out that way. So that would be similar, you know. Okay. Rob, I'm going to ask you to do the same. And I guess it would be the 89 season, um, <laughs> which was a powerful, powerful season. Um, if you can kind of compare the same and then flip it on, bus on, the, on this business side. Sure. Um, yeah. You guys did major work that year. Major. Oh, yeah. I mean, 89, we, we, you know, that was. That, and that was, was your first. Was that your first year as a manager? Sec well, I well no, that was actually my first full year as a manager. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. So that that was a that was a great uh, year. You know, I was a sophomore, um, so you know, had the freshman sort of figuring everything out under underneath my belt, and a lot. So that year, Alonzo came in 
as a freshman. Uh, we had Dikembe, Charles Smith, John Turner, um, you know, Milton Bell, um, uh, Dwayne Bryant. Uh, I mean, we, we just had, we had a house, you know, and, and we, were, we were actually ranked number one for a good portion um, of that season, you know, and we had full expectations of winning it all. We, we ran through the Big East tournament. Um, uh, and it, it was just a, an incredible year. The energy, the excitement around the team that year was, was, was unbelievable. And, you know, having the Twin Towers, you know, we had rejection row uh, where every time, you know, somebody did a block, Dikembe or Alonzo did a block, they put that hand up and they were, that thing was pretty full every game. So it, it was just uh, an exciting time and, and a great year, a great time to be part of the program. Um, you know, we made it to the, you know, the final eight and, uh, you know, so didn't make the final four, but it was just a, it, it was just an incredible, incredible year for me um, and for the team. Um, you know, I, I would, uh, in terms of off the court, um, the thing that, um, I remember the most was actually um, graduation. Um, and, you know, uh, my, so my dad, my parents were never married. My dad uh, was a huge Georgetown fan. So when I went to Georgetown, and he was a huge John Thompson and basketball fan. And when I went to Georgetown, that really sparked some strength in our relationship and he was what he was a big fan of the team and we started to get closer and he came down he came down for graduation from new york and i just remember um you know coach thompson coming to graduation dikembe uh dikembe markham and i graduated in 91 and um he came um he and miss Fenlon both came and he spent time with us my dad was there and the love that he gave me um, and the things that he said were just so special. And it just made me just, you know, it just, it just made me feel so appreciative. And it, it also- and You got me brought, over here feeling it, yo. Yeah, it also brought my dad, like my dad being there and him talking to my dad and telling my dad things about me, you know, it kind of made me feel even more accepted with my dad. And it was, you know, what he did there was, um, was truly special for me. Um, so I, I, I will never forget that. And I got, I have the, I have the pictures and, and so forth. Um, but it, it was incredible for me. Awesome. Um, you just brought up, obviously you brought up some feelings um, that I think we all have. Um, and I just want to touch on something that was always, always stuck out for me. And I've told this story a million times. It's just probably not the wrong. Um, one of the most memorable moments for me, or one of those things that's a little thing, but it, 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 it stood out for me and it made an impact on me. Ron, during midterms or finals or whatever, um, you know, would literally, we would, finished practice, the dude would, we get to the locker room and you turn and Ron would be gone. Didn't shower, left in sweats. Now we all know you don't leave Big John's gym with his shit. You don't take his gear out that gym. Like that's a problem. Don't, don't matter, it doesn't matter how much he got. You just don't take his shit out that gym. This dude here, man, would be gone. And you know, you know how we we were talking about that camaraderie thing. We 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 Joan, we talk, we we gonna cut, we're gonna cut up on a cat that does that. This dude ain't shy. But it was Ron. And we knew he was going to study somewhere. He was going, he he had he had bigger things, he had plans. We down there talking about practice. This dude talking about business and psychology or whatever he's doing, he working. That always stood out to me, Ron. That was that that's made a funny. difference. And that's funny. This is not a shout out for me, but uh, after you left, Kirk Hall was scholar athlete in '83, and Dog I was scholar athlete in '84. 
Wow. Um, so that's that's the impact. And what Rod talked about at the, the onset of the show, that's the impact that you have on people. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, I, I you know, Rod's share was crazy. Memorable moment for you, Spike. No. Uh, it'd be a big and, and just let me, let, me, let me just, you know, shout out to Kurt Call, because uh, one of our biggest investors, uh, Kurt, uh, uh, has a set has the same investor, but Kurt, uh, the investor put money in the Kurt's fund before ours, and Kurt had coached me up on how to deal with these investors. That was about five, five years ago, and now they're our second largest investor. But wow. it was that again, <laughs> Kurt was looking out, you know, for your family, for your family, yeah, your family for sure. Uh, I'm going. You know, I wouldn't be the guy that I am if I didn't ask uh, biggest disappointments. Um, and Ron, I, I know I know one of yours, like you wanted to be on the court. I get that, because I was on your <laughs> team. I get that. So it's going to have to be, <laughs> hey, Ron, he wasn't just coming down there just to work out. He was trying to get, he was trying to get minutes. Yeah, don't, don't let the smooth taste <laughs> of you and the fact that he got a head of hair right now. <laughs> he, he wanted to be in the game. But, but I'd like to hear from both of you uh, a, a big disappointment while you were on the hilltop just to keep this thing, you know, just to keep it real. Well, let, let, me, let me say this. My biggest disappointment was early at Georgetown because it was this cat from Hunter Hess called Sleepy Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> this, and, and I was... <laughs> He, he and I were vying for the same position shooting guard. I mean, it was great for Georgetown, great for the program, but he didn't miss a shot for a week that first week of practice. I said, oh, shit. It's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, <laughs> how do you hey, with that? Hey, Ron, y'all want the pack? I thought y'all were a package deal. <laughs> yeah, that, I did too till that first week. <laughs> 50-50, right? 50-50 with the PT. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, no, nah, that was, uh, bro, yeah, but I'll, I'll leave it with that, Gene. Leave it with that. I, what about I, you, Ron? I, well, it's funny. I remember Coach Thompson used to talk about Ron a lot. And and he, you know, he, he talked about, you know, um, even from when he recruited him, um, but actually, Ron, I think you told this story. You told the story of uh, whenever you, your number got called, you know, it was like, oh, shoot, it, it, the game is over. It's that garbage time. We're, we're like, we either going to lose the game or, or way, way up. And there was one time where uh, I, I believe you guys were down big. I can't remember the game, but apparently you came in and you know, just went off. I don't know if you remember this game or this story, because I heard it from multiple, uh, a couple of sources, but you just came in, you started Ding up and you kind of turned the game around and put us back in and, and we ended up winning the game. Um, but I, I, I do remember hearing that, that story. <laughs> um, so, but uh, I, you know, disappointments, um, you know, <sighs> It's funny because I would say I don't really have a one big disappointment per se, but one of the things I learned from just being at McDonough and being on the hilltop and being in practice was, you know, don't get too, don't believe your own hype and stay grounded because I would say I'd have little disappointments, if you will, because whenever I started to feel like myself and feel like, everything's going great. I'm, you know, and maybe walked around with a little too much swag. And I think a lot of the players felt this to everyone that was around coach Thompson, he recognized it. And he saw if your head was getting a little bit too big, uh, he had a way of bringing you back down to earth and, and calling you out. And, 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 and he always had a way of finding that, that spot that would, would really would hit you. And he would say it in, in front of everyone. And so I, I definitely remember having a couple of times where I just was walking around thinking, you know, everything's going great and maybe was feeling myself a little bit too much. And Coach Thompson kind of 
in front of everyone, you know, would, would bring me back down to earth. But, um, you know, I, I don't, I can't think of one big disappointment uh, uh, throughout my four years that, that really stands out. It would be maybe a few little ones. Uh, Markham just popped back in, so I, I figure there's some. Uh, Is he gonna remind me of one? comedies <laughs> coming? No, no, no. Since, since I, I'm, I'm breaking protocol a little bit here, hopping back in, but uh, <laughs> since Raheem doesn't have uh, a disappointment to share, I will share a disappointment that involves him. Uh, there, there's all this. Gene always talks about me being three-time manager of the year, and that's great. Um, uh, it was it was a good time, but my senior year, I desperately and I'm looking at this like this. I'm, as I look at my screen, I'm thinking about Sesame Street. One of these things does not belong here, and it's me. And it's because all of you three won the student athlete of the year award. And my senior year, Ra, I think, got it his junior year, and. I did not want to be manager of the year. My roommate situation changed. I'm not going to go into that. But my roommate situation changed. Yeah, but this is Hoyer Locker. We're and, supposed to be going into that. And I felt like with new roommate, and Raw actually got my old roommate. So I was like, my study habits, my ability to focus on my studies is going to be great. And I'm getting that award. My grades were in, improved drastically. And we're at the banquet, and when they announced the uh, Student Athlete of the Year Award, I'm waiting to hear my name, and I hear Raheem Bell, come on up to the stage. I said, God damn, this smart dude here did it to me again. So, I'm, sure, I'm, sure the, I'm sure the verbiage was a little bit more hood than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, you know what? You know what, though? That reminds me of... Uh, because I always wanted to have the manager of the year award. And Markham got involved, <laughs> as he said. But you know, one thing, and so I was, that was a disappointment. But one thing that Markham did um, was he actually that year, he got the manager of the year award and then he gave it to me. Mm. He gave me the, wow. his manager of the year award. And I'll never forget that. And but it, manager of the year was something that oh, I always wanted. It's interesting because I've never heard you say that, Markham, that you wanted the scholar athlete. But uh, you stepped up and actually gave me. I don't know if you. I'm sure you remember. You gave me that yeah. award. I still have it. Um, uh, so thank you for that. Wow. wow. Well deserved. You Helped me out a lot. Need, you need to stay here, Markham, because we're coming up on an hour. And I, I want to thank these two esteemed gentlemen for giving us this time. It means the world to us. And I think it means the world to the program. I think it represents what the program is all about because we know that deflated ball, even though we might've made fun of him when we got there, like, yo, dude, put some air in the ball. Um, but once we, once it was broken down to us, what it represented, um, I think, um, I think we all embody that. Um, what I'd like to, uh, I, I, you know, what I'd like to ask, um, you know, given the climate that we're in now, um, I'd like to just go back to when you guys were there. What was it like being on campus um, as a black man, as a brother on the hilltop? Majority, majority of the team was black. The campus was majority white, predominantly white. What was that like for you? Was that an issue? Was that a non-issue? Was that a learning curve? And obviously, I don't know if you guys have read Coach Thompson's book. So what I like to use as the backdrop is what Coach Thompson's dad told him, study the white man. And again, it wasn't about studying individuals. It was about studying the blueprint, studying the game. So with that as the backdrop, um, I'd like to hear our two guests um, speak on that. Uh, I'll, I'll take a shot at that first, Raheem. Um, to me, uh, look, it, it was a, a lot of great exposure, Georgetown, with people from diverse backgrounds, uh, uh, white people, 
uh, Asians, Hispanic, you know, just for my work with Winston Salem, it was it was a big difference to me uh, on an everyday basis. And Gene, I I learned a lot in that environment from uh, you know my white teammates. I can talk about you know Jeff Jeff Bullis, you know, let's say for example where. Uh, he used to listen to Jackson Brown. I'm like, what the hell? Who's Jackson Brown? And this this uh, song Jackson Brown, he used to play it all the time. And uh, and I and it was literally 14 years later after Georgetown that this Jackson Brown song really uh, was monumental to me personally. Wow. That helped me with a tough personal decision. And I went back to some of those Jackson Brown lyrics. And so if, if I didn't know Jeff and the white world, I, I never knew Jackson Brown or anything like that. Uh, so <laughs> it, it was some of those experiences, but, and then it was overall the exposure, you know, we were, shit, to be honest with Jim, we were too busy with, 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 with practice, 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 prep, 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 uh, school, school, school. That I didn't have a lot of time to think about this. <laughs> this dichotomy. Dude, you was leaving the gym in your in your warm up and your practice stuff. You didn't have a lot of time. I get it. <laughs> I was I wasn't thinking of the the macro social issues. <laughs> you were the sociology major, <laughs> Raheem. I'm gonna leave it to you. Yeah. Well, well, that's hilarious. It is. I mean, full disclosure, I'm half black, half white. Spoiler alert. But, but uh, and, and it's funny, because I'll never forget when I first started as a manager and, you know, coach sits us down and, you know, we're, the manager's sitting on the side, the players on, this, on the chairs, coach looks over at me and then he says, now who is this motherfucker? You know, and he points at me. And my hand gets I'm, the first motherfucker on the call. <laughs> we, I didn't know we had a count. Okay. <laughs> oh uh, yeah, but, okay. Well, Markham's County. <laughs> okay, okay. So so then he looks at Johnny Jones and he says, Johnny, is he is he black or white? And Johnny, being ever the philosopher, says, Well, coach. On the one hand, he could be black, but then again, on the other hand, he could be white. <laughs> and everyone just cracks up. It's like, okay, Johnny. Um, and I started cracking up, but that was my introduction. My literally my first day as manager that 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 happened. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's funny because I, uh, you know, I I felt like. With, with the Georgetown family, there was just always this place you could, a safe place you could call home and be safe. And, you know, and, and um, you know, coach obviously was very, very, um, put a lot of time and attention into um, helping the cause of the black man, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, Coach Eshrick, Miss Fenlon, Lori, Michael, you know, he he was very accepting of everyone. You know, I think there was this perception out there that he was this, you know, uh, you know, just militant and just, you know, but he was one of the most accepting people in terms of culturally, racially, and that's something that I don't think people, a lot of people know. But for me, the Georgetown family was just you know, a, a very, very safe place where I, I could derive energy and strength, you know, as I went out into the community. Um, but the beautiful thing about Georgetown was there, you know, it was, as, as Ron alluded to, it was so diverse, you know, um, and, and, and we also had, you know, the center for, you know, the, the minority organization for the, the students, that was strong you know, those two things just gave me a lot of comfort and, and, and grounding where I never felt out of place or, you know, um, I didn't feel like I had a home or didn't belong. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, 
again, I appreciate your time. Um, this is what family's all about. Um, Rod, I didn't, I didn't rock what you do, but I feel like I, I feel like I did, especially after the day, man. And uh, Spike, you already know how I, I feel about you. Um, what, I, what I'd like to leave you both with um, um, is what, what just popped in my head and actually Markham hooked me up with the, with the text. Um, the chance of you two working together one day, uh, what that would look like. Um, I'd just like to throw that out there and put that on both of your dome. Um, if you need me to carry the bags, I will carry the bags. Ron will tell you I'm good at carrying. I'm a frontline kind of guy. <laughs> so whatever you guys need in terms of spearheading something, um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to be involved. I, 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 I implore uh, the program to get gentlemen like yourself in front of the current team. Um, because again, that deflated, deflated basketball stands for something. Um, I just had a, a tech scenario with uh, Dikembe's son. Um, he opened up um, his Twitter for questions. And one of my questions was simply, uh, what, were, what, what led to your decision to come to Georgetown? What were your motivations in making Georgetown your next step? And, you know, these youngins today, you know, they, 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 they're a little different. And, and that's not a good or bad thing. That's just, that's just a fact, right? They should be. And he hit me with, uh, you know, I'm coming there to play ball and study. And that was perfect. But then he ended with, it's pretty simple. And I thought to myself, nah, dude, it, it, it's not that simple. Um, so again, I just wanted to throw that out. I wanted to lob that out to you two. And last thing I'd like for you to do, Ron kind of touched on what he's doing now, but I'd like for both of you, if you can just let our listeners know, especially if any Hoya players are listening, uh, what you guys are currently doing now. Go ahead, Ron. Yes, so sure. So, and actually on your last point, so Ron and I, We've, we've crossed paths and Ron's been a, a, a tremendous mentor to me um, since that day. And, but we have crossed paths on a, a couple of transactions. I think TVA was one of them. And, you know, so we've worked together on some stuff. Um, so I, uh, I currently um, am a partner in a wealth management company, asset management company called Gen Trust Wealth Management, which has offices in New York and Florida. Um, about four years ago, I invested in a behavioral health company though. Um, and initially did it as a silent investor and a passive investor. But in the last two years, I have taken on an active role with that. And it's, it's called True Path Wellness and Recovery. Um, and essentially it, we deal with, it's behavioral health. So mental health, uh, drug and alcohol addiction, those are the things that we are helping people with. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things that for me, um, I've had a number of experiences uh, with people who've suffered with addiction in my family, professionally. Um, and it's interesting how I got led to this, this company. Um, and, and as I said, initially, I said, I was just uh, providing an investment but as I learned more and I saw more about what the company was doing, I, I took on an active role and I'm currently the CEO of the company. Um, so it, it's just tremendously rewarding for me. Um, and, um, you, know, at, you know, if you look at this last year, what's happened with this pandemic, um, you know, the amount of, of mental health issues that have arisen and the growth in, in in problems with respect to mental health and, and as a result, uh, addiction is, is just mind boggling. And, and we have seen it. And um, it's just really a privilege and an honor. And I just feel blessed to be able to be part of this company and to be leading it in terms of helping people get the, the, the necessary help that they, they need. Uh, but it's called True Path Wellness and Recovery. Um, uh, it, it, it's spelled T-R-U. Um, and uh, uh, the T is, uh, trans is for transformation, 
at any point in your life, you can make a change and you can transform the path that you are on. The R is for responsibility. Um, it's our responsibility to uplift ourselves and to uplift those around us. And the U is for understanding. Uh, you have to understand that what you feed your mind is gonna result in the circumstances that, that uh, you have around you. Um, and those are things that we, we uh, teach and, em and embody. Um, but uh, True Path Wellness and Recovery is the name of the company. I'm just really happy and excited to have the opportunity to be leading it. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, no, that's great for him. I'm gonna circle back with you. Yeah, I, so I saw you writing it down already. <laughs> we already know, come on now. <laughs> we already know. <laughs> hey. <laughs> that's what you do. <laughs> hey, so so Gene, currently uh, um, the founding managing partner, I run a private equity fund. We've got a couple billion dollars uh, that we look to buy companies uh, privately. Uh, typically hold them for th three to four years. Uh, so I'm always looking for investment deals, guys, uh, and willing to, uh, you know, I, I need that. If, if you guys see things out there, and typically we're trying to buy companies with earnings. It's, it's not startup stuff with earnings of anywhere from 10 to $50 million. Uh, but if, 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 if you've got uh, in your wheelhouse, so that's how you guys, I could could help me, and, and I could help you or any of your friends or networks because uh, we pay fees for for finding these kind of transactions, and and gladly we'll do that. Uh, so uh, that's gone tremendously well. We have fun and have big investors, and 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 have very strong returns. Um, I'm also uh, uh, in my role. Uh, as a director of Pfizer, being on the board of directors of Pfizer, I've, I've really come to understand and appreciate biotech um, and new technology in, 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 in medicine. Uh, and I'm really intrigued, Gene, by it and just fascinated with it. And so I've started to just make biotech investments um, on my own and look at biotech uh, so anybody, uh, that's what I'm trying to do as well. So in your networks, Gene or Markham or anybody, uh, uh, I'm just, and, and what's ahead with what I've seen, the development of the vaccines and just what's remarkable what genetics and messenger RNA can do, it's just spellbound. And, and for the, the, this younger generation and the new generation and the new Hoyas, I think to be aware of those things is, is, is important for them uh, and, and it's exciting, so. Well said, well said. Thank you both. I would be uh, miss without, um, without saying, uh, extending uh, warm and well wishes to you and your family during this challenging time. Um, stay up, uh, let's not make this, uh, uh, Let's make this frequent versus infrequent. And uh, I can't thank you both enough. Um, yeah, I, thank you guys. Um, thank you, Jim. Your Sunday, I appreciate <laughs> you. And we'll definitely, what I'd like for you guys to do is um, maybe send me uh, some things I can tag uh, you on. Um, I mean, I know you're both private cats, but if it, there's some place I can tag uh, this, uh, this episode, I'd like to do that. I think it's important that the people that you work with and work for um, know um, that you know, this, this is your foundation right here. This is where you guys come from. And we're saluting you and celebrating you for a reason. Um, so again, Hoya Locker Room salute. I appreciate you both. Uh, stay safe and we'll definitely be in touch. Thank, Thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Thank you Mark. Thanks, Ron. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye-bye.